What's going on, y'all? This is Dr. Andrioni, AKA The Cannabis Doc. First, if this is your second or third time on the channel and you haven't subscribed yet, this is the universe telling you that you need to subscribe. This is part two of a series of videos about terpenes. In case you didn't get to see the first video yet, I'll put a link to that video in the description below. In today's video, I'm gonna be going more into the how and why of terpenes. Specifically, I'll be going into terpene production, terpene composition, and then I'll be wrapping it up with how we actually perceive terpenes. There's a lot to go over today, let's dive in. If you remember from the last video, the primary site of biosynthesis for terpenes as well as cannabinoids are the glandular trichomes of cannabis. Production is most concentrated in the unfertilized female flower of cannabis. I had also said that the building blocks of terpenes are these tiny hydrocarbon molecules called isoprene units. To get a little bit more specific, there are two universal precursors for any and all terpenes. Their names are isopentanyl diphosphate or IPP and dimethyl allyl diphosphate or DMAPP or DMAP. And take note, each of these guys have five carbon atoms. So when we combine one IPP with one DMAP, we produce a 10 carbon molecule called geranyl diphosphate or GPP. And then the combination of two IPPs with one DMAP produces a 15 carbon atom molecule called farnesyl diphosphate or FPP. And so GPP and FPP are probably the two most important molecules when discussing terpene production. GPP is the parent compound from which all monoterps are derived and then FPP is the parent compound from which all sesquiterps are derived. And we know that cannabis mostly contains monoterps and sesquiterps. Oh, and wanna hear something even cooler? The cannabinoids also share a common precursor with the monoterpenes. GPP, along with olivetolic acid, is the other precursor needed to produce CBGA, which is the parent compound to THC, CBD, etc. What's more, the GPP that's used in the cannabinoid biosynthesis comes from the same pathway that uses GPP to produce monoterps. But with that being said, if the cannabinoids can affect us and they're almost essentially derived from terpenes, why couldn't terpenes affect us? So from here, enzymes called terpene synthases will use GPP and FPP as substrates to catalyze the remaining terpene reactions. And although there's been more than 150 terpenes identified in cannabis so far, the same has yet to be said about the respective enzymes. Only a handful of monoterp synthases and sesquiterp synthases have been identified so far. If we take a look at this graphic here, terpene enzymes have classically been grouped into clusters. The enzymes that we really care about are mainly in cluster B and some in cluster A. And actually it's funny because these gene clusters are shared amongst older similar plant species. There are a bunch of other clusters too. And really we're just kind of scratching the surface of the cannabis genome. The literature so far has demonstrated that terpene synthases are rather promiscuous. So we may not need as many enzymes as there are terpenes. Let me explain. Enzymes are proteins that basically kickstart the reactions for any living cell or organism. And in this case, they're catalyzing the reactions producing terpenes. Normally, enzymes are super picky about which molecules that they interact with. These molecules are called the substrate. The substrate will bind at a certain place on the enzyme called the active site. And it fits into that site like a key fits into a lock. And really, because of this, most enzymes can only accommodate one substrate. However, with terpene synthases, it seems to be a different story. While there are still some terpenes that will only accept one substrate and produce one product, i.e. one of the myrcene synthases, it also seems like other terpene synthases can accept multiple substrates. As long as that chemical structure is pretty similar, then I guess it's okay. And thus it can kick out multiple kinds of terpenes. And that's really the promiscuous part. And we know this is true because we see this with limonene. Limonene is the precursor to other terpenes like carvone and eucalyptol. Oh, and it's these same enzymes that cause the loss or addition of the oxygen containing functional group that would make it a terpenoid, not a terpene. If the product remains a terpene, they'll still undergo numerous reactions to further alter their structure. Sometimes the reactions can be more complex where the structures will actually gain a ring, i.e. pinene and limonene, or they can lose a ring like myrcene. And then other times the results of these reactions are so subtle that you're just like, okay, Kyle, take a look at limonene and terpeniline. Seriously, the smallest difference. But touche, that super tiny difference makes a huge difference in their aroma. All right, so now that we covered terpene production a little bit, let's get into terpene composition. We should know by now that the cannabis that we use and consume is always going to be determined by genetics. However, the environment does play an important role as well. If we look at the literature so far, researchers have confirmed a trend between the types of terps being produced throughout a plant's life cycle. If we take a look at this figure, most of the terps initially produced in the flowers and the fan leaves are all sesquiterpenes. However, the proportion of monoterps dramatically increases over time as flowers develop from juvenile to mature. What's more, researchers have observed that the cannabis plant will even cause terpene fluctuations throughout the day, depending on the time of day. As we see here, the diurnal pattern of light literally gives life to the plant. And actually, studies have confirmed that terpenes are very much dependent on light and heat. Heat? 
What do you mean heat? Kind of weird, right? But yeah. Actually, one study found that different temperatures will affect terpene emittance. They showed that at around 35 degrees Celsius, alpha pinene was more dominant. Whereas at 55 degrees Celsius, the emissions of limonene and myrcene were way more dominant. It's also been shown that a number of other environmental stressors will also cause terpene production indirectly via a hormone called jasmonic acid or methyl jasminate. That's all I'm going to say about that. So now that we've reached the full mature stage of cannabis, it's now time for the harvesting, curing, drying, and then even extracting. So at this point, what are some of the variables that will affect terpene composition, or rather terpene preservation? These guys are the plant material itself, the time of drying, drying room conditions, storage conditions, etc. So the type of plant. In terms of what kind of plant material was used, I'm talking about either live or fresh frozen versus not. Overall, more terps and cannabinoids are always going to be preserved when the biomass is fresh frozen or live. Specifically, the monoterps are going to be preserved. When the biomass is traditionally cured, you're always going to have some sort of monoterpene loss due to how easily they evaporate. So the time of drying also matters. In drying room conditions, humidity is a huge factor. In addition, you don't want the air stagnant. You want to keep it circulating. This allows any remaining moisture in the plant to be circulated out during that drying process. You don't want the moisture to get trapped and beat up because that causes bud rot. Never have the light on while drying. Storage conditions. The most amount of cannabinoids and terpenoids have been shown to be preserved under vacuum seal storage. And then let's think about extraction. If you're going to be extracting with any kind of heat, if it's hot enough, there's an increased risk that you're going to be losing some terps, specifically monoterpenes, due to their volatility. My guy, why does this seem like everything needs to be right for these terps? Preserve the terps! That's because they're fragile AF. Everything does need to be just right. And actually, if you do lose a lot of monoterpenes due to evaporation in the process, that'll be reflective in a change in the aroma that you can actually detect. I'm not saying it's a bad change. Sesquiterpenes are super pungent still, but because you're losing some of the monoterps, it's gonna be less sweet. As a general rule of thumb, monoterpenes are the most fragrant molecules and they tend to be sweeter and fruitier, where sesquiterps are more of an earthy, grassy, herbal kind of smell. Not always, but mostly. And then really quickly, I want you to picture this. You're on vacation, or you're not, I don't care. And you walk into a hotel and this smell just overtakes you. It smells absolutely godlike and you're just so happy to be there. And then sadly when you leave, when you think about it, you have some good memories. That's the power of smell. <laughs> and guess what? Terpenes happen to work the same way. So we have 10 cranial nerves. Cranial nerve 1 or the olfactory nerve is what gives us our sense of smell. And just like terpenes are one of the ways that immobile plants communicate with their environment, our sense of smell is one of the ways that helps us perceive the signals that are coming from within our environment. And so through evolution and the framework of our nervous system, smells or odors actually have the power to change our mood or perception. Multiple studies have shown that very small amounts of fragrance compounds via inhalation causes an indirect physical effect by activating olfactory memory. And it's been shown to influence our behavior as well. What's a fragrance? You mean like a woman's cologne? A fragrance is any volatile chemical component with a molecular weight of less than 300 Daltons that humans perceive via the olfactory system. Because they're so volatile, they have super high vapor pressures, they have low polarity, etc. All the criteria that terpenes have. And that's because they're the same thing. If you're volatile, you can do anything. Once a fragrance enters our nostrils, it eventually reaches the olfactory epithelium in the superior posterior part of the nasal cavity. The olfactory epithelium is covered with mucus and it has olfactory receptor cells sticking out of it with cilia. The mucus is there to trap the odor molecule and then the cilia is there to detect it and bring it to the receptor. These odorants then activate receptors that then transmit a signal to the olfactory bulb. Then through the olfactory tract, which then relays that signal to important areas of the brain such as the amygdala, the thalamus, the neocortex, the hippocampus, etc. And guys, our brains have over 40 million different olfactory receptor neurons that help us detect and distinguish between types of odors. It's important to realize that this is different from how sound and sight are processed, which first sends its signal to a relay center and then out to other regions of the brain. Whereas with smell, which seem to have evolved before the others, there is no relay center. It just sends those signals to different areas of the brain. And this is what it means to trigger olfactory memory. This is why some smells can actually trigger our fight or flight response. Smells can help us recall memories. And more likely than not, it can make your mouth water. To give you an example of how powerful terpenes actually are, have you ever heard the saying, hey, go take a walk in the woods to clear your head or a forest or whatever? Well, that's because when you're doing this, you're hopefully in like a coniferous or a pine forest because once there's a lot of pine, there's a lot of alpha pinene. And actually, if you had seen the alpha pinene video, we know that alpha pinene acts as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And once we have more acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, we definitely have faster neurotransmission. Funny enough, this practice is called forest bathing. And there's a term for this in Japanese called Shinrin Yoku. Maybe that was kind of a stretch, but guys, have we forgotten about aromatherapy? What's the basis behind aromatherapy? 
you inhale something. Mm -hmm. A lot of essential oils are the basis behind aromatherapy. And essential oils are essentially made up of terpenes. And guys, I know I just super emphasized us smelling terps, but it's not just that. We inhale them too. Once we inhale them, they go straight into our lungs, into our blood, straight up to the brain, where they can then affect us there too. And if you guys remember from my other videos, I throw around that word bioavailability. Even though it's a pain in the ass to say, it does mean something. The more bioavailable something is, the more bioavailable it is to us. And monoterps tend to be more bioavailable than sesquiterps. And again, this is due to that volatility. And once they're in our blood and approaching our nervous system, because of the terpene's chemical structure, again, they're hydrocarbons essentially, they easily pass through the blood-brain barrier, which would then allow them to have the medicinal effects they do. This could get really complex really quick, so I'm gonna stop it here. I don't wanna bore you to death, but I'm gonna end it with this. If you guys didn't like my other examples before, we do know that terpenes have an effect on us. And I hate to butcher this, but I do love this example because it's so easy to understand. When THC is the gas pedal, CBD is the brake pedal, and really terpenes are the steering wheel, the terps are the things that will direct you where you want to go. And this really explains why you can smoke two different flower products with the same THC percentage, but feel two totally different effects. My God, this video was long. You guys, I think I need to chill from terps for a while. I really hope that you found this video interesting and cool. If you guys liked it and you like my vibes, please like and subscribe, you know what I'm saying? That's it for now. I'll see you guys next video.